OSP, or Office of Special Plans. It seemed that it was taking too much control of the invasion planning. One of those experts agreed to talk. I was transferred in May of 2002 into the Near East South Asia Directorate, the Middle East Directorate. I was surprised to find that the war plan for the invasion of Iraq was already on its second coordination. Okay, hold on now, guys. Lieutenant Colonel Karen Katowski now lives on her farm in the Shenandoah Hills in West Virginia. As a career officer for 20 years, her job had been as a political military analyst, preparing secret documents and briefings for the Pentagon. She knows. But after 9-11, the papers she was ordered to produce caused her a lot of concern. There was concern that information was already being maybe misused, uh, that, that there was a particular uh, certainly an agenda, which was the pro-Iraq war agenda, but also uh, that information was being shaped. By the autumn of 2002, Karen and her colleagues found that they had to obey, without question, the orders of the mysterious OSP. We would simply call the Office of Special Plans. We would say, we have a paper due, we have a background paper, a briefing, whatever. Please give us the talking points on this subject. They would send those to us on email in a Word file and we would take that word file and copy the text exactly verbatim with no changes and insert it into our word file, into our document. And that's how we were instructed to do it. It was to that level of detail. You are to copy verbatim, there will be no changes, no additions, no alterations, and no deletions. In whole, you would do that now. For the regular staff officers of the Pentagon, this was not a normal way of doing things. Moreover, the shadowy OSP was being run by untrained personnel. I think that the, the shared opinion, certainly my opinion, but I think it was shared by many, was that these people were remarkably uh, unacquainted with uh, military, security, strategy, or anything else that we do in the Pentagon. But more disturbing to Karen was that this information became American policy and was being broadcast to the world. Imagine those 19 hijackers with other weapons and other plans, this time armed by Saddam Hussein. Seeing those talking points reflected in some cases verbatim in President Bush's speeches and Vice President Cheney's speeches, when we knew, compared to the intelligence, this was very misleading. We knew that this was not right. Less than a teaspoon of dry anthrax, a little bit about this amount. Unscom estimates that Saddam Hussein could have produced 25,000 liters, and Saddam Hussein has not verifiably accounted for even one teaspoonful of this deadly material. I had questions about, this seems strange, what's happening, why, why the rush to war, I don't understand, intelligence doesn't support it, why would we be uh, so far advanced in our war planning by the summer of 2002, I mean specific war planning, invasion planning. Um, what's really going on here, why are we doing this? It's obviously not for the reasons that they're hinting at. As the countdown to war began, the OSP continued to churn out the alleged misinformation. From recent intelligence, we know that the Iraqi regime intends to declare and destroy only a portion of its banned al-Samud inventory, and that it has, in fact, ordered the continued production of the missiles that you see being destroyed. The other alarming thing from the fall, beyond hearing what the president was saying, these, these basically lies, the president and vice president told the American people lies in the fall of 2002. Uh, mushroom clouds, yeah. That's not true. Uh, nowhere in the intelligence could you ever get to the point of a mushroom cloud if you stuck strictly to the intelligence. But of course, they were, they were fabricating in order to get the American people and the Congress on board. Finally, Karen felt she could no longer continue working at the Pentagon under those conditions. She resigned from the Air Force. Did that make me disloyal to Rumsfeld? Did it make me disloyal to Wolfowitz and Doug Fife? and Bill Ludy and Dick Cheney, and technically George Bush, yes. Yes, it did, and I, I to this day will tell you these guys have not upheld the Constitution um, in any way. They have not preserved uh, the rule of law. In the same week that Karen left the armed services, George W. Bush's invasion force stormed into Iraq. By defeating Hussein, George Bush Jr. had done better than his dad. It appeared he'd achieved all of his promises. But once the celebrations of victory against this axis of evil country had passed, 
White House statements about the reasons Iraq was attacked were being forcibly challenged. High on the list were Saddam's supposed weapons of mass destruction. There were hundreds of inspections made before the invasion, and many hundreds after, but not one had produced a single WMD. Perhaps there had been a conspiracy in place to fool the American and British public all the time. For over 30 years, Alan Simpson has been active in the political world in Washington. Obviously, they didn't go into Iraq for weapons of mass destruction for the simple reason that the United States provided Saddam Hussein with all his weapons of mass destruction, or the, the, the precursors. So the US knew exactly what was in there. Um, they, um, they had to pull the wool over the public's eyes. The US knew, and we know that they knew it, that Iraq had no weapon systems, no unconventional, that is, biological, uh, chemical, or nuclear weapon systems, nor had they had any probably since 1991 or 1992, because US-led weapons inspectors had carried out more than 9,000 inspections during the 1990s, going everywhere in the country with almost unfettered access. And so the Bush administration knew full well that there was no weapons of mass destruction. With the scent of a conspiracy in the air, accusations were hurled at the US government that the conflict was an unjust war. US media and TV went crazy trying to find out why their country had invaded Iraq. And as the accusations mounted up, pressure began to build on the man in the White House. You could argue that the, whilst it was a mess and is turning out to be a real mess, the intention there to, to seize the oil reserves for the benefit of the, uh, of the West was a very valid reason. So perhaps all along, the war was just about oil. Every country needs oil to survive, but the US is utterly dependent on this stuff they call black gold. Although it only has 5% of the world's population, the US uses 25% of the world's oil supplies. And now, with oil supplies dwindling, and with countries like China competing for what's left under the ground, US officials think they need to secure and control as much foreign oil as they possibly can. And most of the foreign oil that's under the ground is in the Middle East, in particular Saudi Arabia and its neighbour Iraq. Before the war, Saddam controlled a country with a quarter of the world's oil production containing more than 115 billion barrels of oil in reserve. Iraq was swimming in oil. It was a tempting target. It's not accidental that the Bush administration sought the, the uh, endless war project in the Middle East because no region is more vital to the United States, meaning to the transnational corporations and to the banking elites and those who are really the captains of U.S. industry, the captains of the U.S. economy than the Middle East, because that's where the oil is. As the invasion forces smashed into Iraq, the stage was set for the mayhem that was to follow. All too soon, the oil conspiracy jigsaw was taking shape. By only the second day of the war, U.S. and British troops had already captured Iraqi oil terminals. Some of these were capable of pumping more than two million barrels a day. It was the same story throughout Iraq. Oil fields, pipelines, refineries and pumping stations quickly came under US control. You know, they can insist that oil had nothing to do with why they went in there. But the fact is they went in uh, very quickly and took over the oil administration, privatized it, which it had been nationalized and is nationalized in most Arabic countries, and, um, and locked out French and German and Russian companies and gave all the contracts to 